Welcome to today's episode. I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano. I am joined today from down under by the shipping lawyer herself, Allison Cusack. First time we've done this together, Allison, so I'm really, really excited about it. I'm, it's unfortunate it's happening, what we're talking about today, but it, nevertheless, I'm happy to have this conversation with you. So today we just had information that the fire in the port of Iskendron was under control and they were getting the last elements out. We don't know how far along they are with that. But we do know that the port for three days now after the earthquake has suffered a, a severe fire. We know the port is going to be heavily damaged. Uh, I was wondering, before we jump into talking about Iskandarian, can you introduce yourself to everybody on what's going on with shipping first? And then we'll jump into this discussion. Absolutely. So Alison Cusack, I'm the founder and principal lawyer of my maritime shipping law firm, Cusack & Co. Um, as you said, I'm based in Melbourne, Australia. So I am from the future. Um, it's pretty awesome down here. And so I've been running my firm uh, that looks after cargo interests, mainly in containerization for almost five years now. And before that, I spent six years as one of the in-house lawyers uh, for the Australian subsidiary of CMA CGM. So I have seen a lot uh, <laughs> when it comes to disaster recovery. I've seen a lot when it comes to um, having a crack uh, and people trying interesting and new things. Uh, and I've definitely seen um, when it all goes wrong. So you build up a interesting repository of, oh, actually, I think I know how <laughs> I would go about fixing that. And um, you get very calm in the face of disaster and panic. So. Hey. And disaster and panic is unfortunately what we see happening. A huge earthquake uh, disrupting everything in southeastern Turkey. And this port, Eskendrin, is really the entrance to not just that region of Turkey, but northern Syria, northern Iraq, uh, Iran, actually all the way over to the Caspian Sea. It, it's it's this little cul-de-sac in the corner of northeastern uh, uh, Mediterranean but really important. And, and, you know, I've been getting questions and I know you're probably the perfect person to ask these two because I've been getting questions on my YouTube channel. It's like, okay, you know, all this containers are lost. This damage is going on. Uh, what's your initial take on what you're seeing in Iskandrin and what's going to be the uh, 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 big fallout from it? So for me, it is the first thing I would be doing is going, we need to get obtain data. We need data because when I first saw the fire, it was, you know, small comparatively. I mean, we're used to seeing whole ships on fire. So, you know, put into perspective what we've seen previously when we talk about these things. So I saw the fire and I, my immediate thought was that needs to be put out. That needs like that has critically has to be put out. And someone was saying to me, yeah, but clearly all of the firefighting efforts, all the heavy vehicle machinery, all of the relief efforts should go um to you know the more disaster zones and I'm like I I get that and I agree but I was saying to this person but I'm looking at phase two because I've never been in phase one um do you know what I mean disaster recovery so if a ship is on fire if a ship is disabled if seafarers need evacuating because of medical attention I'm never going to be that person do you know what I mean who is operating the winch on the helicopter who's doing the firefighting efforts who's on a tug you know, maneuvering things. I'm that step back going, what's going to happen next and what can I do now to save something in 48 hours? Because, Sal, as you may have seen as well, in these things, they rapidly escalate. And for me, it's, okay, I can do something right now and control a controllable that's going to save property, infrastructure, whatever, in 48 hours. Um, because in 48 hours, more options are off the table and we've seen the fire has consumed more material because it's these stacks are you know perfect for engulfing fires um and so yeah so data data information is what i'd be getting first um and i can go a bit more into that if you want some nice itemized lists or no it will go into it i, I think you're exactly right I, I think you know when you first see that what i got from that fire again from being a mariner from being a firefighter for 20 years now is you see a small fire and all you see is it's going to grow. It's just going to get bigger. And 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 those containers are just tinder boxes of bricks of fire waiting to go. And we've seen it happen on ships before. And, and this was a situation where you're exactly right. I mean, the priority is life safety and get everyone. But the next thing is bringing in those relief supplies and bring. And this is the only port. This is it. This, this is it. I mean, there are those 
those four ship the shore cranes were it. And, and, and I was looking at those, like, you got to get them out of the way. You got to save those cranes. You got to minimize this damage as much as you can. You got to put a fire break in and move the containers out. But at the same time, I, you, you got to save lives. And, and, well, yeah, and, and that's, and, and that's the thing. And that's how you sort of go, we, we can work as a team. Um, and, and it's, it's bad because the first thought I was thinking is this is going to sound so callous because everyone's going to go, why would you save a port? But I know, especially being an island nation, it's still just even in an island nation like Australia, it's it's so bizarre to me when people say, yeah, but we just we bring it in by air. Right. They're like we, we bring things in by air. We bring our refrigerators. And I'm like, do you not know how expensive air freight was? <laughs> and of course, I couldn't say that in 2021 because <laughs> they were on par freight rates. But your relief efforts, your water, your food, your medicines, your pharmaceuticals, your, you know, just blankets and, and all those things that are phase two and three, they're going to come in via sea. And how are you going to get ships that necessarily have, like if you're mobilizing ships very quickly, they're just going to, you know, pull off service when we have so little capacity as it is. You don't want to have to wonder if your ship has a crane, an operational crane that'll work. You want to know that you can just bang stuff in containers properly packed, of course, we don't need more disasters, so that you can get it in. But if your port is not operational, because so, a port is the perfect place to bring in relief supplies because it's already set up arterial to move things in and out. Like it's the lack of shipping knowledge that just really unfortunately shines through. Do you know what I mean? The lack of understanding about international shipping in these situations really is clear and not understanding how this is such a major piece of infrastructure that you want to save. Yeah. And, and, and how vulnerable it is to something as simple as a fire and, and why yep. you need almost dedicated resources to fight fires in those areas. Uh, you know, everything from fire trucks and, and personnel to boats, everything you need in that area needs to be there because like you said, it's going to be supplying not just in Skendron, but the entire region that, that, I mean, it's your entry point in and if you don't have a clear entry point it's just going to clog the whole i mean there's something we learned from the supply chain i mean right it's yeah. it, it's 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 going to be the, the the log jam that you have in this situation let's go back to the data issue because i think that's really important because i mean we're seeing here a material loss of half those containers that were in the port and there's no telling how many containers i've been trying to do a rough estimate just based on stack size oh, stack and then you're you talking can... thousands of boxes that are going to be lost at this point but the thing is you don't even know what's in them so right. that's concerning from two perspectives. The first perspective is you don't know what's about to go up in flames, right? So from a firefighting perspective, how do you know how to conquer that fire if you don't know if it's got hazardous material or, you know, if you're treating it with water when you should be treating it with CO2 suppression, you know, and I, I'm not involved in firefighting, but I've seen enough TikTok videos that show what happens when you use the wrong fire suppression method. Thank you, Hate Green. Um, but so data is... What have you got currently there? What can you save? Um, you know, you could even reach out, depending on what it is, you could probably even reach out to the suppliers and say, hey, you actually happen to have X, Y, and Z. Could we, can someone buy it off you? Can a relief agency buy it off you? Can we redirect that? Um, because why would you export it? Or why would you let it sit there when it could be repurposed? Um, but then it's a case of someone somewhere is going to have to handle this. Just because there was an earthquake as horrific and devastating as that's been, someone is still going to have to process those containers. They cannot just sit there and be scrubbed and said they're done. Do you know what I mean? Someone's going to have to, the stevedores, the ocean carriers, the suppliers, the insurers, you can't just, you know, you're not going to put them in a pile and say, don't worry about them, leave them in the corner, don't care what's in there, clear away. Like you can quarantine them for a moment, but they're going to have to be, you might as well um, gather data now but the problem is who's got visibility do you know what I mean who has the master list of vessel planning for export and if it's a container ship and it's a um, multi-carrier you know what I mean it's a vessel sharing agreement it's really it's very rare that any one planner has that specific visibility on all the containers all the contents and all the bill ladings which sounds ridiculous right but they quarantine their data so that they don't steal customers off each other. And, and, you know, that's such an important thing because, again, you may have 
equipment sitting on that dock that are essential that you're going to need that are maybe being exported or or maybe it's heading somewhere else and now it can't get there but you could use it immediately and prioritize it you know you hate to think that there's you know something life-saving in a box and you just don't know it's there and we, again we don't even know if the personnel who have that information are alive because they could have been killed in the earthquake or the the data could have been destroyed in the computers or, or we know there's power in the area because we've seen lights on at night but it, again it, it, it's such a huge disruption and again as you said companies will segregate out that cargo they'll segregate their information they don't come and share it's a big issue we're having in the united states that we're trying to fix with more visibility but companies like being proprietary they don't like sharing this stuff and so you know getting in there and ascertaining what's in there is going to be key yeah and so it's it's always been an issue so for people who are not quite um you know, who don't review time charter documents on a regular basis i mean what are you doing with your life if you're not doing that um <laughs> You know, there's things like caps on cotton, right? Because if you have too much cotton, it's not great for the ship, right? But if you've got six different ocean carriers putting cargo on board and everyone's like, shh, it's not has. Yeah, okay, technically, but not when you put them all together and you exceed the cap. So who's, you know, this has been an issue we've known for a while. Um, and so the question is data. Who's, who's making the decision, right? Because if we take a full step back, the containers belong to the shipping lines. The cargo belongs to the shipper. We'll just make that broad assumption and forget about negotiable bills of lading to just take a layer off this. The stevedores have a contract with the ocean carrier, right? So it's not vessel-based. It is in Japan, but for the majority of ports, I mean, I could be corrected if it's on Turkey, but it's the stevedore has the contract with the ocean carrier the ocean carrier has the contract with the shipper so the carrier owns the containers but the shipper owns the goods but this, it's on the stevedore's key so who does what when and who's going to make a fuss about it later because it's all great and this is this is from having done clean up six months after the fact it's all fine to say get in there and fix it what does that mean and do you have the authority to do that and I know it sounds crazy, but if you've been involved in enough incidents like this where six, 12 months down the line, the tail stings you and everyone gets hauled over the coals for not doing the right thing, even in the face of disaster, that that really kicks back in. And they're like, we're not allowed, we're not allowed, we're not allowed, we don't know who can make a decision. And then you've got 16 stakeholders going, I don't know who's allowed to make a decision, and the fire... <laughs> grows and grows and grows and everyone goes who's responsible for moving this pile over there checking the crane so we can get the ships in like who and this is where your disaster management from a government level needs to kick in and there's a lot of countries very susceptible to this because even australia is slowly catching up but even australia is has very poor visibility about what it means to be an island nation and being served you know majority of our needs by vessels. I, I so, mean, no, no, we, we, I mean, I, I would argue we saw the same thing in the United States when we were in the midst of the supply chain crisis, we had ports handling things in different ways because in the United States ports are state and local control. They're, they're not under a national control at all. There's a provision to put them under national control in case of an emergency. The question is, when do you declare that emergency? And usually it's time of war. That's what you tend to look at. But in a, in a crisis, you know, there may be a time where you have to nationalize or put some sort of oversight in, in control. Like you said, you know, you, the problem we have coming out of Turkey is, is conflicting information. We were hearing from the, the Minister of Defense that the fire was out two days ago, and yet you're seeing live Twitter and it's burning, you know, out of control. Yeah. And, and, and so I was like, okay, that's not happening. Uh, you know, now you see some actions being taken in the port, and it was really interesting to watch what happened. I mean, there were, there, there were firefighters on the pier. There there were tugs, there were Coast Guard vessels, there were aircraft. I mean, there's a whole slew of things being done there. And, and again, we, we don't know what caused this. I mean, again, again, we, we had a container stack collapse because of the earthquake. You still shouldn't have containers bursting in the flames because they move like that. And now, you and you know, someone's going to hunt out who, who's responsible for this, too. And that's that's so and this is where it becomes intellectually fascinating because it really people are going to be like, it doesn't matter. And you're like, but it does. It does matter because. What's to say there's nothing underground that's filling that fire? Do you know what I mean? 
like, I don't know, I, I doubt there's a gas man running under there, but, you know, what if there was something underneath that when it cracked it all sparked a fire? But at the same time, you're right. You shouldn't have, we see stack collapses on board vessels. We see stack collapses, um, you know, just at ports normally because people aren't adhering to VGM and they're like, oh, who cares if it's under? And I'm like, well, if a five ton and you think it's a 20 ton, it does matter because you'll get a stack collapse. I don't think I've ever seen a fire start from just a mere stack collapse. You know, what What was, and if it was improper packing, right, and everyone goes, oh, why are you being such a lawyer and improper packing, who cares? Because if you've improperly packed something and it has started a fire that has taken out hundreds of containers and immobilised the key port into multiple countries in a time of crisis, yeah, it kind of matters. And that's what... Unfortunately, we only get to like have impact when we say this is the, and like oh, but that's work, worst case. That'll never happen. Like it should never happen. So I get very <laughs> frustrated when I try to, what? you know, explain to this, and people go, "My one action won't matter, and my one action won't matter, and my one action won't matter." And you've got twenty thousand TUs on a vessel with twenty thousand stakeholders saying, "My one action won't matter." And and you know. As much as we've seen this happen, everything from ONE Apis to Zim Kingston rolling in to Express Pearl, I mean, we've seen this over the past year or two. And 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 what made made Iskandrin really stand out for me is this: is like, okay, this is the worst case scenario because this is a literally an unlimited TEU vessel sitting on the dock, and you had a stack collapse. And stack collapses happen. We, we it happens in a port. It's something someone drives something, something that's improperly stacked. You have a collapse. And if you can burst into flames like that in Skendron, it can happen in LA, it can happen in Sydney, it can happen anywhere. And now all of a sudden your liability issues, because what we know for a fact is that cargo compatibility and putting hazardous material next to each other doesn't always happen. You know, the, 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 the proper stow does not happen. We know that happens because things are improperly marked, not labeled correctly. And I, I think Iskandrin really shows that right there, the danger of moving containers at such a fast, rapid rate. You stack everything together. I, I mean, I don't know what kind of controls they had for moving containers. I, I'm going to sit there and say probably not a lot because they were just trying to move boxes, not really thinking about that. And that kind of contributed to the situation you see. Well, it's, it's really interesting because when Beirut had their explosion, it was really fascinating to me because everyone went oh, terrorist attack and i went nah i reckon it's like tangent and there's an over capacity of has and i'm yep. like that's it, it, it's bizarre right that you're like something as devastating as a terrorist attack actually can happen because everyone just sort of goes that's the way we've always done it it's fine it's never been a problem who cares who cares who cares containers they're amazing but they've turned what we do into widgets you don't have to manually hand it over and look the person in the eye look the master look the man in the eye and say and i know this is way before my time but i've heard enough stories you know you hand it over and you look the master in the eye and you go this is what i'm giving you and they had you know and they wrote it out and it's here's the, here's the copy for you and here's the here's the here's the you know um carbon and or here are the originals and back in the day we could tell the master exactly the cargo we were giving them. But now in the advent of technology and the internet, and even when we had faxes, two days post-sale is when you'll provide said to contain. And, and, you know, I just did a story the other day on the small container ships and how many of them are having issues. I mean, one in Iran recently. And I mean, just it seems to be it. And I, I keep trying to tell people, it's like, you got to understand, it's, it's, it's like these, when you take one container off a huge container ship, it's not a big deal. It's it's 20 tons off a ship that's 200,000 tons. But when you take a 20 tons off a vessel, that's a couple of thousand tons, it's huge. And, and if your weights are not right, everything's not reported correctly, that's a problem because you're going to roll a vessel. It's just going to move because re- all of a sudden it's it, it's stable and you lift 20 tons off because it comes off immediately. We never used to be able to do that. We, you know, we had to move bundles. You had to move bales. You had to move pieces. You didn't move blocks that are, that are just massive in size. 
And then all of a sudden you create these instabilities. I was, you know, watching the firefighters going in and the helicopters coming over. I kept thinking, man, they're moving boxes around. They have no idea what's in those boxes. They're, they're just picking them up, trailing them. They're dragging them at one point. I saw them dragging boxes. And it's like, man, you don't know what you're moving around in that box. You have no idea. It, it can it could be ammonium, you know, nitrate. It could, it, could, it could be, you know, oil or gasoline some or chemical. And, and you're sitting there and you don't know it will be spontaneously combust. It could be a flexi bladder of coconut oil or a flexi bladder yeah. of white white oil, right? And any any oils in a flexi bladder trigger, you know, the has code, but no one goes, everyone goes, oh, it's fine, because if it was fine yeah. IBC, it would be fine. And I'm like, no, it's not. Um, but you don't know if that shuffle will pull over a rough bit and then suddenly flood 20 yeah. tons worth of oil onto your fire. Or if you've got reefers and reefers are powered by gas. Oh yeah. What's happening? You've got little pockets of mini explosives ready to go. So when I think this all started when I was someone on Twitter said, How do we even start? How do we even start to fix this? And when it was a small fire, I was like, go in, you get your hands and you get your reefers. And they're the first things you try and identify yeah. and pull out. And then the rest, like you put out the fire and you pull out your hands and your reefer because they're they're your problems, right? They're gonna make life what? so much worse. And, and let's assume you know where they are, but you know, as you saw in the, in the problem, is the stacks collapse, so you can't even go into row five, you know, bay twelve. Do they? But if it's if it's stacked for export, that's not that's not in the that's not in the holding stack. That's not in the pre conveyor right. stack where you where you pull it. And if there's smoke and there's smoke damage and there's soot, how do you read the container numbers? Do you know what I mean? These aren't RF, oh. RFID tubes. These aren't. No. You have to manually go, is that, a, is that a three or is that a six? <laughs> and I don't want to get close enough. And, you know, you can't exactly send a drone in to do it because, you know, that's. And so people don't. I said to people go, oh, but you know where the containers are. But no, I don't. No. no I don't. And I think this is someone, where. Someone it, lost a helicopter at a port. We lost a helicopter at a port. I'm like. That's that's how my that's the lack of visit. People are so used to going. I'm on Google Maps and I can share my location. Like you know, Sal, I'm coming to visit you and I can share my location and we can track each other. Life three hundred and sixty. That it is. People want to bring shipping into the twenty first century. And I'm like, can right. we can we bring it up to nineteen eighty first? Before this we is kind it, of- it's an industry that still has fax machines. So I, I mean, I keep telling okay. everybody. I've I've signed up on a lot of agency agreements. <laughs> where you can serve notice by fax, and you can yeah. say we are we are terminating by fax. And someone goes, "Who? Oh, what's the point of that?" And I was like, "Because it's in the contract, and this is a tiny port, regional port. The internet is down more than it's up. So, are they working on paper? Are they working on shorthand? Are they are any of the documents in English? Are they do they have this short? You know, it's not a big I mean, it's not a big port like you'd say LA is, like Singapore is. People fall into these accepted customs and practices and you don't know about them until you have to know about them. And so you can never assume. My my rule is never assume anything's been done right, anything's documented right, <laughs> anyone genuinely knows what they're doing. No, because my philosophy is everyone lies. All my customers, all my clients, everyone for two reasons. One, they're either deliberately lying because they don't want to admit that they don't know something or they want to hide something or, you know, don't want to get told off by their lawyer. Fair, but I can't help you. Or they're lying because they're parroting something someone else told them and they believe it to be true. Yeah, that's true. So, yep. you know, everyone's like, it's force majeure. And I was like, show me the definition. But it's force majeure. Show me the definition. Well, but it's just underlying it's just it's the it's the standard terms and conditions and i'm like show them to me well you just brought that up allison so i'm going to go to you with with the question that i would ask a shipping lawyer like you all right i had a container that i was shipping either in and out of the port it was in there and now it's i i don't know it's gone it's it's destroyed and everything so who 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 do i need to sue allison Who, who do i sue on this and how do i get my money back this is my favorite. This is my favorite. Who to sue? I wrote a great article after the APL England going, what's your payout? And the answer is not as much as you think. So the first thing you do is you pull out your bill of lading. 
your master bill of lading or your ocean bill of lading, right? And you'll say, Alison, but I'm not on that. Cool. So you have a freight forwarders bill or a house bill. So if you're on the, so even though shipping works, you know, manufacturer to client or end customer, we actually start in the middle, right? So the master bill of lading that's issued by the ocean carrier, that's where I start and I work my way out. So if you're the shipper on that and you still have control of the bill, then you're going to lodge a claim with the ocean carrier. And they're going to turn around and say, welcome to a concept called limitation of liability. <laughs> and it's either going to be the Hague rules, the Hague Visby rules, US COGSA, and maybe a weird quirk, depending on what's going on. You, um, you need to say this in the Danish accent because I'll be shipping with Maersk probably. So you need to give me that uh, the, the Copenhagen uh, accent. I'm, right there, I'm, right? No, I'm, no, I can, I can mimic accents after a few drinks, but not, not <laughs> I haven't heard it. So you're going to say Maersk, MSC, CMA, you know, Costco, pick the top four. Um, my goods are damaged and they are burnt to a crisp and I'd like to do a claim. And if they are bent or Chris, then you're like, it's a total loss. And if it's not, you're going to have to go, well, did you mitigate your loss? And that's a whole, whole nother thing, but you always have to mitigate your loss. So assume it's total write-off. And they say, okay, so show me the bill of lading. And under the Hagen Hague Visby, because they'll, Hagen Hague Visby are international conventions. And some of it is mandatorily enforceable, depending on if your country has signed up to the convention and just check Wikipedia. It's pretty easy. Um, or the back of the bill of lading will say which convention applies subject to international convention. So, for instance, you might have Hague Visby rules, but if you went to from or through US, then US COGSA, US Carriage of Goods by Sea Act trumps that because they're all powerful. And so you get the limitation of convention. So you look into the face of the bill and it's what's enumerated on the face of the bill. So, what's the number of packages? What's the weight? And what you do is the nifty little calculation and you plug it in and you work out what's the higher limitation of either. And that's your limitation. So what they use is what's called special drawing rights, SDRs, and it comes up as XDR on, you know, currency exchange. And what they've done is a melded pot of currencies, five currencies to offset currency arbitrage. So you have like, US, euros, um, pounds, yen, and I think China as well is in there. And so you work it out and you go, okay, it's 20 tons or it's a thousand packages. The problem gets in when you say, I have one container or I have 50 pallets, or you could say, I have a thousand boxes or I have 50,000 widgets. So people think that that is not important. But you always, 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 if you can learn anything from this, you always want the limitation of liability to be higher than your loss. Because if the limitation of liability, say, is $500 and your cargo is worth a million dollars, the ocean carrier will be like, yes, your cargo is damaged under our care, custody, and control. Here's $500. Thank you. <laughs> and I, I find it hard to believe a carrier would do that to, to, to one of their customers. I just, I just, I, I find that very, very hard to believe. I have to say, and I got to ask you this too, because because I'm, I'm watching this, and again, it, it's a huge tragedy. I mean, there's no telling me thousands oh, have died is, in this. Yeah, we're, we're talking about the, you know, the businesses and the right. cargo that get caught up in this, and and the humanitarian crisis is another whole other. You know, we are we are very much focused on what's going to play out in the next three to six months. But but the aspect I see of this too is is I'm looking at this. This is a port hit by an earthquake. And I'm looking around the world. It's like, man, there's a lot of ports that are on earthquake faults around here. I just think of the West Coast of the United States. And I'm thinking if this happened in LA and Long Beach, holy cow. I, I, I mean, the, the scope and scale of this, again, this is a port that handles the Skandra maybe about a million containers a year. So it's a good sized port. It's a good medium sized port. But but it's nowhere near to what we see with with large ports around there. And you know, I, I would say it couldn't happen, but man, this has been the decade right now for for everything happening since 2020. You know, everything we thought that couldn't happen in shipping has happened not once, but repeatedly. I mean, it's almost March. There's an evergreen ship due to due to oh. due to ground any moment now. You know, with that we have apt, with an apt name. It has to have an apt <laughs> name. No, but this is the thing. People said to me, oh, containers overboard, is it common? And I was like, no, no. The APL England is an anomaly on the back of the wine efficiency, right? Total anomaly. And then you have the Maersk 
um, Essen and then you had one Apis and you're like, I wrote an article just summating all the different incidences and putting a dollar figure next to it of just the initial impact and it was just horrendous amount of millions of dollars. But the other thing was, remember when we were in a container shortage crisis? Oh, yeah. Every time you had a vessel that was like 18, 16, 18, 20,000, that goes in for repairs and inspection. And those 20,000 containers, we slow the rate of movement of those. So you they, you take them out of circulation. You're like, we, we don't have 20,000 containers to spare as it is. But you're right. This is the decade of everything that can go wrong will go wrong. And do you teach your students about the Swiss cheese philosophy? I, I don't, but go, go ahead. Let you go ahead and share you know, that. You've got, you know, you got slices of Swiss cheese and you've got holes and other holes. And we say, you've always got to prepare for when you get all this. So every slice is a procedure or a person or a checking machine, right? And when all the holes line up and it sails right through, that's when you get shipping disasters. But speaking of earthquakes, I'm pretty confident a couple of years ago, New Zealand had one of their ports taken out by an earthquake. Yeah. And and the rail and everyone went, just go around, I guess. We're just going to, we're going to go. But that New Zealand's a smaller, you know, part of the chain. When we had, what, 100 ships waiting at Long Beach? 109 at the height. Vessels. If there's an earthquake and, you know, Dwayne the Rock Johnson comes in to save the day. <laughs> Wasn't he in one of those? Yes, he was. He, he, was, he, he was in, uh, I forget which one it was. I think it was San Andreas. I think it was San Andreas. Yeah, San Andreas. Okay. What is going to happen to the port? And who's going to be able to get in there to get all the backlog containers? And where do you divert them to? And what do you do with, potent, you know, what if it happened? And everyone goes, oh, stop being... So scary and stop thinking about the worst case scenario. What if what happened in Turkey happened in LA with 109 vessels waiting? Because I, the I, thing is, you've also got these floating. If you had a stack collapse that caught on fire, how do you save that ship? If the firefighting efforts are at the port and you've got, you know, the, the flow on effect is mind boggling. And, and, and that's and that's what we see. I mean, you know, we, we talk about the black swan events. And one of the things I've said recently and over and over again is, is like, you know, black swan is supposed to be a rare occasion. You're supposed to see one and that's it. We're getting dive bombed by a flock of them. And it just seems like every time you turned around that we were coming out of out of this, you know, another one happens. and We just can't get the flock out of here. And it's just it's 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 one of those problems that. I, I try to raise it with, with people who are shipping all the time. You know, when you start talking about general average for the very first time and people hear that term and like all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, I got to pay for the ship getting stuck. I had nothing to do with the ship getting stuck. And now I've, I got to. I've been a long running general average nerd. Uh, I'm the self-confessed general average nerd of Australia. And everyone's like, how's it? How's it? You know, and I'll, I'll go into people and they'll go, I've never heard of general average in 20 years of freight forwarding. And I was like, you're lucky. Cause I, I genuinely can split freight two two types of freight forwarders. Those who have suffered through a general average event and those who haven't. Right. And it is such a clear line of, I have insurance, I have things organized, I know what my paperwork is, I'm never doing that again. Right. Because I can, can let me be clear, I know people with ever forward who are just like, man, I'm doing this. And I, I knew it with ever given too. It's like, I am getting general average. I'm not going through this ever again. I will pay whatever it costs to get this done. And, and, and again- it, Insurance. That's why you have insurance for worst case scenario to go, hello, insurer. I don't think people realize that insurance came from shipping from Lloyd's. I mean, the whole story of it is 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 from shipping, and, and I is responsible for so much law, like boundary law. You know, the twelve nautical miles and the two hundred EZ shipping. Do you know what I mean? Like territorial laws are based off shipping. We have an entire act between us and the Dutch about. If you find one of our old shipwrecks from when we came and explored your coast, you just have it because we can't be bothered anymore because there's just so many. Take it. Like, I don't even care where it is. We we, we cede sovereignty on that. Just take it. You know what I mean? Like, contracts. Oh, yeah. Company, company law, Dutch East India Trading Company, a company, an international company, company law comes from shipping. And, and, we, are, and we are the forefront of everything except for finding our boxes and technology. And what one of the things I find really interesting, of course, is is the parallel today with the power of the shipping companies versus something like the Dutch East India Company. They, you know, they become so powerful, so so entities onto their own. I see it right now in the U.S. with the FMC, the Federal Maritime Commission, finally having a little bit of standing to go 
against just a little bit, just to make that little bit of inroads against companies like MSC and Maersk. And it's hard. It's hard because they're behemoths and, and they've become these giants and and they, they just, you know, even even fines don't slow them down. If MSC is not slown down by one of their ships being seized with the most amount of drugs ever before and they keep trucking along, they're going to keep moving in, in this pace. Hey, I find it interesting because that was the number one conversation I had all during COVID was I had a contract, but they weren't honoring it. So I just gave up. And Shipping. I was like, and the funny, okay, so this sounds, and I said, I said to people, I'm like, I've won against the carriers heaps. I've won against the carriers heaps. Yeah. I've gotten them to waive all sorts of fees. Cause I'm like, no, nah, that's not legit. And I'm like, oh God, never, ever, ever assume that a big company is doing the right thing in terms of, what they say their contractual rights and obligations are. Never assume that because they are a multi-billion dollar company existing around the world, that they are doing the right thing by you and telling you the right thing. Question everything. Ask for everything in writing. Ask for them to point to you where in their terms it says that. Because the amount of times I've caught out the big ocean lines on complete BS and one, like my client's cargo had a lien on it because they were hit with a 30,000 USD missed deck fee, except it wasn't misdeclared. And also they couldn't enforce penalties in Australia. And about an hour before it was discharged off the vessel, the shipping line said, oh, fine, fine, it's waived. Fine, fine, I give up. Fine. And my client is like, best money I've ever spent on you. Telling yeah. everyone. And, 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 you know, Alison, I'll, I'll say this that I say to a lot of attorneys I, I know that do this is you just got to go at them. You just got to be willing. For some reason, people will back down. I, when, when I was talking freight rates, people would tell me, man, I, I can't get them to honor freight rates. They're just, you know, because because a freight contract isn't worth anything. It's just it, it, it it's just and I was like, are you crazy? It's like if you if you let them think that that's that's why they think that because you yeah, don't challenge so them. People go, uh, it's too hard. And I'm thinking. And I said, do you have an FMC contract with those rates? And like, yes. And I'm like, that is gold. That's you it. Have FMC rated. You you need an you need an FMC contracted rate to ship yep. into the in and out of the US. That is that is gold, especially after all the work they did around um, anti-competitive stuff. Yep. So you know, there's this weird there's this weird hilariousness well, for me at least because I'm not doing it anymore between the anti-competitive rules in Europe and in the US. So. In one, it has to be less than 31 days. and the other one, it can't be more than 30 days out. So with the time zones, there's like an 18-hour window to move <laughs> to, to advise a GRI. But people had contracts, right, that said all in, all in, including BAF, including CAF, including, um, you know, port fees, port handling fees, no GRI. And then they were getting the GRI and going, oh, okay. Well, Allison, we're coming up on on our time, and I, I want to just end on on get get back to Skendron for a second and talk about what you think is the big issue that we should be looking for coming forward here, or what's the big problem you would see on the horizon based on the situation. I think, in a show of unity, without forfeiting any of their legal rights or insurance rights, and not upsetting the PNI clubs, if the affected PNI clubs and carriers can come together and basically appoint someone as a point of control to just say, for this pile, we are going to work as one, not in any competitive sense, but, you know, the EU commission, but we're going to work as one to just say, do what you do what must be done to fix that and we'll, we'll sort it out, you know, all later with all the lawyers and all the insurers two years down the track, but do what you need to do to make this port operational so we can get in relief. I think yep. that would be the number one ask for the carriers to do something very uh, impactful without ceding any of their, do you know what I mean, liability. I, I think you're right. I, they got to do something. They got to move containers fast. They got to empty them out, clean them out. I mean, they got to be overhauling them. Uh, I mean, there's probably fire still lingering in them. And like you said, they're just going to move them out of the way because they got to clear them out from the port. They're going to be opened and looted probably and stuff taken out of them. And it probably just easier yeah. just to move on. And like you said, declare total no, loss. You, and could just, you could just declare all of them a total loss. And then if anything is picked up later, work it out as a charity auction or whatever, but just say anything in the port bounds, 
total loss, we'll pay you out, we'll sort it out, let's just declare that almost like, you know, declare every container on that key as, you know what I mean, like a sunk vessel of sorts. Yep. So we got a, the priority is operational port relief aid in. Well, Alison, I appreciate you coming on. I know we're, we're doing this from halfway around the world with each other. So our time zones were a little bit off. We we're a little off on our time zones. We're obviously not masters of, of figuring that out, but it worked out. So we were able to do it early in the morning for you or, or uh, just about afternoon for you, late evening for me. We're a day or so apart, but it, it worked out really well and everything. Can you let everybody know where to follow you, Alison? What's the good places to go to uh, follow you? Absolutely. So Alison Cusack on LinkedIn, also got Cusack and Co, Proprietary Limited on LinkedIn, a uh, little bit on Instagram, The Shipping Lawyer, or Cusack and Co, sorry, on Instagram, and then doing things on TikTok as The Shipping Lawyer. So you can find all my handles there. Yeah, and, and website, cusackandco.com.au. And, and, and I follow you on as many social medias as I can, especially when, t- when Twitter's working, it's great. And, and it's always oh, a yes. good one to do. So uh, it's always good. I appreciate having you on. And unfortunately, I think this is probably not going to be the last time we're talking about a problem in an incident. Unfortunately, one of the consistencies we know in shipping is give it a day or two and something bad will happen. The Black Swan series. That, that's that's exactly it. So for this video, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. I want to thank Allison for being here. And most importantly, for everyone there, hey, if you enjoyed what you watched, take a moment, subscribe and like Go ahead, hit that bell to be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment for either me or Allison. You can give either of us a comment. We'll take it and share it across social media. Until our next episode, this is Sal and Allison signing off.